Hi, my name is Jim McQuiston, and I'm going to talk to you about Oak Island, Nova Scotia today. And I have a little slideshow to show in the background. So I'm going to get that up on the screen here. And you'll see that I haven't left you. I'm up in the corner right here. So I've been working with the Oak Island team on the Oak Island treasure mystery for the last four years. And by looking at my books, uh, it helps me tell the story. I sent them a small bit of information in 2016, and I had, they asked questions, and I had sent them so many emails that they eventually said, you need to write a book because this is all going to get lost in our emails. So I wrote my first book, Oak Island Missing Links. Uh, part of it dealt with the Gloose Cap legend of Nova Scotia, part of it dealt with the Knights Templar, and part of it dealt with the possibilities of sailing across the North Atlantic before. Christopher Columbus sailed across the main ocean. So they had me come up to talk about that book, but in the meantime, I was finding more information. And so after I spoke with them in 2017, I went back and I wrote uh, Oak Island 1632, because now I had a date and the people involved, which were essentially the Knights Baronet of Nova Scotia. And they suggested the second book, too. <clears throat> when I went up to speak to them about this book in 2018, they uh, had me look into this knighthood medallion. And it's from 1671. And it was found up above Oak Island at New Ross. So we talked about that, but we talked about my new discoveries. So I decided to write this book on my own, Oak Island Nights, because it was my main theory. I now had to who, what, when, where, and why. After that book, uh, they had me come back up in 2019 and film me again in the war room. And uh, I started finding out these family connections between the early landowners on Oak Island and some of the early searchers going back to the Knights Baronet of Nova Scotia. So I put those in my last nonfiction book, which was Oak Island Endgame. So I look at it kind of like Oak Island Knights is the cake and Oak Island Endgame is the icing on that cake. But all four of these books stand on their own. So there's about uh, 700 pages in these books, but I kind of wish the story was all one. So I wrote a non or a historical fiction book called Oak Island, the novel, and it kind of tells the story from the beginning to the end, and it's a little bit more lively. It's not just facts, although the quotes that are in it that are in italic type are the actual documents. Uh, sometimes I've had to modernize the language because it was difficult to understand, but they're the actual documents. So if you just want a fun read, Oak Island, the novel is the one to read. If you want the, just the facts, ma'am, uh, you want to read Oak Island Endgame probably first and then go back and read Oak Island Nights and then back like that. So they're all great books, I think. There's 900 pages total of uh, research and writing. So what are my credentials? Well, I'm a fellow with the Society of Antiquaries, which gives me access to them, to the Scottish National Museums and the Scottish National Records. I'm related to the premier knight baronet of Nova Scotia. His name is Sir Ian MacDonald McCushton, and McCushton is the Gaelic form of the McQuiston name. I've made three trips to Scotland and four to Nova Scotia, and I've been on Oak Island for 10 separate days. I've appeared on the Curse of Oak Island TV show five times now, and I have the number six theory. And uh, these are some of the other, uh, I wrote for several magazines, articles on Scotland and on Celtic culture. And I wrote a number of other books before my Oak Island books started. So I've been writing books for a long time. Here I am in the war room. The significance of this picture more than anything is that I was the last person to present in the war room. And so this picture is historic in the sense that nobody else presented in this room after me. They built a new war room up around the corner that was sturdier, had better air conditioning, and it was away from the tourists. So right after I got done with my talk this year, they removed all these photos and artifacts and moved them up to the new war room. I was back again in 2018, and that was the film footage that was shown uh, in the 
2019 season of Curse of Oak Island. <clears throat> and uh, here we're in the war room talking about this knighthood medallion. Uh, I found out who it was given to back in 1671, and I theorized how it got to New Ross. This was a Saturday, and there was no Prometheus production team to film us, so it was just Doug Kroll, Rick Lagina, and myself, and the gentleman who found the medallion. The only place you'll find out about this medallion is in my book, Oak Island Nights, and the significance of it. <clears throat> so I was back up in 20. 19 and I got a kick out of a quote that I gave Rick was on the wall of their museum. It's right there, James Arthur McQuiston, author. And here I am in front of the uh, Reader's Digest article that they have framed. Charles Barkhouse right here, he took me to see the Nolan Cross Rocks, which was a great adventure. I met Laird Niven in his office in the archives building and I met again with Gary Drayton. Now I've known him since uh, 2017 and we've enjoyed a lot of hours of talking. I love this picture because this is an actual screenshot from my appearance that was shown on April 9th, 2019 and I'm sitting here between the two premier Oak Island historians, Charles Barkhouse and Doug Kroll, and they're actually listening to my theory. So I love that photo. So how did Nova Scotia start? Well, in uh, 1621, William Alexander was granted a charter for that land. And the charter was written in Latin. And so no, New Scotland, which he wanted to call it, came out as Nova Scotia. Well, he liked it so much, he kept the Nova Scotia name instead. And, uh, but he knew he needed uh, manpower and money so he got King James to create the Knights Baronet of Nova Scotia in 1625. That's when my family signed up. And uh, we were in the secondary position until 1908 when the Gordon line died out. They were the premier baronet up to then. That line died out and the McDonald McCushton line moved up into the premier position. Well, where the heck is Nova Scotia? Uh, it's out on this eastern end of Canada. And it originally was part of the uh, uh, English colonies. And after the revolution, some people in Nova Scotia wanted it to continue to be part of the uh, English colonies. This is Maine right here, this last little bit of gray. And so just across the Bay of Fundy is Nova Scotia. So it was one of the first places you came to as you were coming over from the British Isles to the British colonies. Here's a more close-up version of Nova Scotia. And you'll notice I have three points of interest here, one, two, and three. One is Oak Island located in Mahone Bay on the Atlantic side of Nova Scotia. And you'll also notice how ragged the Atlantic side is because it's getting all the wind and waves. Right up above there, about 20 miles, is a mysterious well and foundation at a place called New Ross. And uh, my research shows that that was a secret estate built for William Alexander in 1623. Number three in this photo is Port Royal. You'll notice on that side, the land is much smoother along the coast because they're not getting the winding waves. But the one thing they do have are the highest tides in the world coming to here. So sailing in and out was a little bit tricky. You had to have the tides, the wind, and the wave in your favor to pull into this little inlet and into this basin where you could park your, safely park your ships. This is the most fought after place in all of North America. 13 major battles fought over that because it's so beautiful and and uh, easy place to have your boats, uh, your ships anchored in there. And you can see up and down the Bay of Fundy and up the hillside to the rest of Nova Scotia. So it was of interest to, uh, to the Scots to be able to take Port Royal over from the French, and they did in 1629. So here's a quick timeline, I'll try to speed through it, but in 1621, William Alexander is given 
uh, New Scotland. And that was because the pilgrims of the Mayflower complained. They were concerned that the French were going to attack them. In 1622, he sends a ship, but it doesn't make it there and it gets stranded in Newfoundland. But that year, another gentleman named Alexander Strachan, I like to call him Al Strachan, plans on stealing uh, the most valuable treasure in Scotland from one of the richest and most powerful men of Scotland. He was the Marshal of Scotland. In early 1623, he actually steals the treasure. Later that year, uh, Sir William Alexander sends a ship called the St. Luke, and they explore the Nova Scotia coast, and they create a little settlement down below Oak Island, and legend and tradition say that they created the secret estate at New Ross for William Alexander. I believe it was meant to be a beachhead from which to spy on the French and eventually attack them overland. In 1625, Sir William creates the Knights Baronet. Al Strachan is given a pardon from the king and he becomes a Knight Baronet and a full partner with William Alexander. In 1628, they finally get enough settlers together and money and arms and uh, supplies and they head out in four ships with a safe passage letter from the king. And William Alexander Jr. or William Alexander the Younger is in command. They reach Nova Scotia in 1628, but they don't reach Port Royal till 1629. In 1629, one of the French leaders is captured and he becomes an honorary Knight Baronet of Nova Scotia and is given land along the southeast coast of Nova Scotia, which includes Oak Island and New Ross. By 1631, a treaty is signed between England and France to give Port Royal and Nova Scotia back to the French. But the Scots that are living there aren't anxious to leave because they invested all this money and time uh, into this dream to be part of North America. Back in 1632, uh, New Year's, came on March 25th. So shortly after New Year's, on March 29th, the Scots of Port Royal were given their orders to leave. They had eight days to pack and three weeks to leave, meaning they had, would be setting sail into a stormy North Atlantic, at least by April 27th, which on our current calendar is more like April 8th. This is the actual order to leave. The said terms of eight days being given to them to retire from said places, etc. They could take their gold and silver with them. They had three weeks to leave. Uh, and the reason there was three weeks is because of the difficulty of getting out of the Bay of Fundy. They couldn't just leave on any particular day. They had to wait for the wind or the weather and the tides. So they had to pick their best day during those three weeks to get out. We know that they had more than one ship because it says specifically their vessels, and they are allowed to take their weapons, their arms, that would be their cannons and their muskets. So they would have had to set sail by April 27th, which is April 8th by our current reckoning. I met with a uh, captain, Robert McKinnon. He's a lifelong sea captain and a very successful treasure hunter from Nova Scotia, thanks to Rick Lavino, who set the meeting up. And he told me that they would be heading into hell to try to sail into the North Atlantic in April. So it's my theory they came around the Cape of Nova Scotia, followed it up to Mahone Bay, pulled in there to take shelter from the storm. That's when I believe they landed on Oak Island. One of the ships sunk, and ever since my second book, Oak Island 1632, I have a sunken ship on the cover of that book. Well, Captain McKinnon told me that he actually dove on a shipwreck within sight of Oak Island. And on that ship, he found silverware stamped with the image of a stag, a highland stag. The highland stag has been the symbol of the Strachan family since 1309. I believe these Scots, who were settlers under Sir William Alexander, buried a cache on Oak Island, which included at least part of the Strachan stolen treasure. This is what Oak Island looks like from the sky. The areas of interest are the money pit. It was a depression found in the ground in 
1795, although I believe people were looking for the treasure long before that. And I believe the three men that found the depression were looking for treasure at the time they found it. A lot of uh, underground structures have been found at Smith's Cove. Well, I walked down that in 2017, and this was just a normal beach. You couldn't see anything there. But once they started digging shortly after that, they found all these structures down there. A lot of ship items have been found here, and a lot of objects from ships have been found in the swamp. And so I believe that these washed in here and here from that shipwreck. So these are the three areas that they're always exploring and always talking about on the Curse of Oak Island show. So who owns Oak Island? Well, all these white lots are owned by uh, what's called Oak Island Tours, which is Marty and Rick Ladino, Craig Tester, and now Dave Blankenship. Originally it was Dan. These gray lots are now owned by Tom Nolan, the son of Fred Nolan. Fred Nolan and Dan Blankenship were on the island for about 50 years each. Tom Nolan has allowed the Oak Island team to explore on his property too. So the only lot they can't explore on is lot five, which is owned by Robert Young. All these lots were laid out in 1762. And this is what I found out from my book, Oak Island Endgame, that a lot of the original owners, almost all of them, had some connection back to the Knights Baronet of Nova Scotia, especially including John Strachan. He owned these same not lots that, that uh, Fred Nolan owned, and that's where the Nolan's Cross is located. So the Nolan's Cross was owned by John Strachan from the same family as Al Strachan, who stole the treasure. Uh, a family uh, of the son-in-law of William Alexander also owned property on Oak Island. There are many, many connections in my book, Oak Island Endgame too many to go into here, but it's way beyond coincidence. These lots were uh, surveyed in 1762 and they still use the same surveys today. Now, I have the history and I have the family connections to support my theory, uh, but what about artifacts? Well, carbon dating uh, is based on wood, so whenever they find what appears to possibly be finished lumber, and sometimes it's not finished lumber, but it's found at great depths where you wouldn't normally think you'd find wood, they get it carbon dated. Not every time, but whenever it's significant, they get it carbon dated. And a lot of the carbon dated dating points to my time period of 1632. This is a display case in the Oak Island Museum. These are some early carbon dating analysis that were done for Fred Nolan and Dan Blankenship. And I made a bar chart of them, the blue, the yellow, and the red. And that created a window of 1620 to 1660. Well, the Alexander family claims to have been in New Ross from 1623 through 1656. And of course, we know that this whole Nova Scotia adventure started in 1620 when the Mayflower pilgrims complained about the French. So the carbon dating, at least some of it, fits right into my window, my historic window. In 2019, this piece of axe cut wood that was found down at depth near the money pit, uh, dated to as early as 1626. And more recently, they found wood uh, under a road that was built in a swamp that dated to as early as 1619. So a lot of carbon dating is supporting my time period. The window now would be narrowed to 1626 for this wood here to uh, the 1660 date. And the halfway period of that is 1634, which is only a couple of years off from my theory. Gilbert Hedden was a gentleman that owned Oak Island and was a substantial treasure hunter there. And he wrote two letters. In one, he said about 1630 for the creation of the money pit. And in another one, he said as early as 1635. It just so happens that the halfway point between those two dates is 1632.5 or halfway through 1632. 
My historical research says that the money pit was created in April, May, and June of 1632. The end of June would literally be 1632.5. Hedden uh, based a lot of his work on mapping techniques and surveying techniques. He was an engineer by trade. So now you have surveying or mapping supporting the carbon dating, supporting the family histories, supporting the historical research that I've done. So the case is really building strong. Uh, one of the other interesting things that Gilbert Hedden said, this tells where he wrote the letters. One was to Franklin Roosevelt saying as early as 1635. In another letter in, 16, in 1967, he wrote about 1630. But he also wrote, I could duplicate it on the other end of the island in one summer season of work with no more than 50 men. Now he was an engineer and he was saying he could duplicate the money pit on the other side of the island within one summer season with 50 men. Two more modern day engineers looked the situation over and wrote a book on it. And they said, we estimate that digging from shaft to bedrock would have taken a crew of sturdy men no longer than three to four months to complete. Well, three to four months is a summer season on Oak Island. So they're saying the same thing Gilbert Head is, is saying, and they're all three of these men are engineers that have studied this very thoroughly. So now I have engineering supporting my theory, not just through Gilbert Hedden, but through these other two engineers. And a lot of people question whether uh, humans could even have dug a uh, pit so deep. Well, the Knights Baronet settlers, they had the manpower because at one point there's evidence that there were up to 2,000 uh, people sent to Port Royal. Now, a lot of those would include ship crews and they didn't stay very long. But still, there were hundreds of men there. These men had to be artisans or craftsmen to even be able to go. That was part of the whole deal with the Knights Baronet title. So they were blacksmiths and stonemasons and leather workers and farmers. So what they wanted to do was build a hundred communities. And you couldn't build that with broken men or ne'er-do-wells. You had to have substantial men to do that. So they would have had enough men, they would have had skilled men, and they would have the engineering know-how because William Alexander and his son were the co-masters of mining for Scotland. In fact, William Alexander had a hand-dug silver well, silver mine, uh, down to 180 feet. He had two more sons, Anthony and Henry, who both served as master of public works for Scotland. Now they built castles and cathedrals and bridges. So in the Alexander family, you had more than enough engineering knowledge just to dig a hole. And uh, in addition to Alexander's 180 foot silver mine that was dug to 180 feet, it would surprise a lot of people to learn that the deepest hand dug well in the world is actually deeper than, it, than the Empire State Building is tall. It was dug to 1,285 foot deep and the Empire State Building stands uh, 1,250 feet tall. So the fact that somebody with rudimentary tools could dig that deep is absolutely proven. They had the engineering know-how, they had the skilled labor, and they had enough men to do it. And there isn't any question about that. So one of the other main parts of my <coughs> theory is what was the weather like when they were asked to leave? Well. I happened to find a study from 1993 where they put thermometers in the waters on both sides of Nova Scotia. So on the Port Royal side, which is the leeward side, it only got down to freezing near the shore, uh, which is zero degrees Celsius, only in February. But on the Oak Island side, it was freezing near the shore January, February, March, April, and May. It didn't really start uh, coming out of the freezing area until June. And my theory is that they were there in April, May, and June of 1632. So I looked up uh, NOAA weather reports for uh, 2017 and 2018, and they show uh, waves up to 20 foot with some rogue waves up to 40 foot, 
winds of 30 to 45 knots, dense fog, and severe freezing spray. Well, that last item, the freezing spray, would be your problem because that would build up on your wooden ship from the 1600s and sink you. And we know that the water was freezing based on this report. Captain McKinnon said that he was up there in April one time and hit 80 foot waves and had to save his crew and his ship. And uh, he had one of his crew members with him that confirmed it. He also said he was up there as late as June and had a foot of snow on the deck of his fishing trawler. So again, he said they would be heading into hell if they tried to cross the North Atlantic in April of 1632. And yet we know they were told to leave by April of 1632. So they had to go somewhere. So the weather of that area also supports my claims. Uh, this is a photo from the money pit in 1897 and a piece of parchment was pulled up on a drill bit and uh, three links of gold chain were pulled up on a drill auger. In 1909, Franklin Roosevelt worked there. Here he is in his white shoes and his pipe. And over the last 225 years, many millionaires and many Freemasons have been involved in the Oak Island treasure hunt. And I'm gonna explain the Freemason connection here in a minute. But FDR, John Wayne, Errol Flynn, and Admiral Byrd were all investors in Oak Island, and they were all Freemasons. And, all, and a good share of the attempts to find the treasure were led by Freemasons. So it would be really nice if I had some artifacts to support my 1600 theory, and in fact, I do. These bones were pulled up from the money pit area. One's a female bone, one's a male bone. They're uh, from uh, Europe, one's from Europe, and one's from the Middle East. And they dated back into the 1600s. Two shoes were found by a sunken wharf, and they, told, they could tell by the way they were constructed that they also date back before 1700. These scissors were found on Smith's Cove. The Smithsonian dated them to 300 and 50 or more years old, which would put it back into my time frame. Fred Nolan found uh, 60 pieces of wood like this uh, that dated 1575 plus or minus 70 some years, which would also put them into the 1632 period. This piece of jewelry was found by uh, Gary Drayton and Rick Lagina, and they had a gemologist look at this cut, and he said that this would be four to 500 years ago, which would also date back to my 1600s. This nail, there were several of them found in various places, but they're hand forged nails and they can't carbon date them, but they can check the metal and the carbon content in them and they dated this to 1700 or before. This is the piece of parchment that was found. And this is kind of a cool part of my theory in that even though the pit was, um, flooded for many decades, the India ink on this parchment was not smeared. So that tells me it was in a waterproof container until it was brought up by the drill bit. But later in 2017, when Jack Begley found the parchment and book binding, it was all smeared with India ink. It was all smeared purple. And the last thing on the treasure list of what Al Strachan stole were title deeds for castles that were written on parchment in India ink and put into waterproof containers. So how do the Knights Templar and the Freemasons fit in? Well, nearly all the Knights Baronet of Nova Scotia who originally signed up with William Alexander to settle Nova Scotia had either traditions of Knights Templar in their midst or actual charters of land for former Templar land. In fact, the lands of both William Alexander and his partner, Robert Gordon, once belonged to the Knights Templar. William Alexander the Younger, who led the Scots at Port Royal, was also the first Freemason in history. His brother Anthony was the second, and L. Strachan was the third. Another brother, Henry, was the seventh Freemason. And in fact, the first seven Freemasons were all connected to the Knights Baronet of Nova Scotia. And a couple of the more famous early, earlier ones, George Mackenzie and Robert Moray, 
were also connected to the Knights Baronet. So it's my contention that Freemasonry came out of the Knights Baronet of Nova Scotia. And I believe the story of Oak Island was kept alive in Freemasonry. Now, one thing I'll say is that you can read about William Alexander the Younger being the first Freemason in a lot of Freemason books and in a lot of Freemason websites. And you can read about him being the leader of the Scots at Port Royal in a lot of history books about Nova Scotia. But it's only in my books where you're going to read that it was the exact same gentleman that did both things. This absolutely ties Freemasonry to the Knights Baronet of Nova Scotia without any question whatsoever. This is the actual document, July 3rd, 1634. It's still held by the Edinburgh Lodge Number no. 1 in Scotland. And here are the signatures right here. I've isolated them over here. This is William Alexander, leader of the Scots in Nova Scotia. This is Anthony Alexander, master of public works for Scotland. He oversaw all the guilds, including the stonemasons. And this is Al Strachan, the man who stole one of the largest treasures ever amassed in Scotland. And this is the record of their installation on July 3rd, and there was there is no other record in any of masonry anywhere that predates this record. So if there actually is no other record, then this is the first Freemason, this is the second Freemason, and this is the third Freemason. So that kind of concludes my talk, but uh, I wanted to tell you that Rick had asked me for a quote. I, first, I didn't realize what he meant, but he wanted a quote to put on the museum wall. And so I thought, I thought, well, you know, I can't just rattle something off the top of my head. I need some time to think about it. So when I got back home, I thought about it, and I, and I realized that um, it isn't any, about any specific person or uh, attempt at finding the treasure or what the treasure even is. And so this was my quote, Oak Island is not so much a mystery to be solved, as it is a chance to experience the unapologetic fascination of youth once again. So I want to thank you for listening to my talk today, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, you can contact me at jamesamcquiston at gmail.com, and uh, I'll email you back. So happy treasure hunting. <laughs>